Pemo, thank you very much. All right, yes, yeah, so I met a lot of you guys. I'm John. I write for Inc. an entrepreneur and sometimes uh, business insider and sometimes fast company about social good companies. Primarily, that's more what my beat is these days. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk till about 7:45, and then we'll have about 15 minutes of questions. And we'll it might be more loosey goosey than that. But um, so I'll just start off with you guys, um, ladies first. Um, let's start off with just talking about yourself. What sort of what's a a brief history of you, uh, Victoria Chang and uh, Matthew Lamoureux, and um, let you guys talk about how you got to where you are, what you're investing in now, and where you're working now. Sure, yeah. So, hi, Victoria Chen, Senior Vice President of Venture Investing at City Ventures. So, I invest in fintech companies and commerce companies. Uh, we, as a whole, invest also in enterprise IT companies, security, big data, AI, as well as marketing technologies, developer tools. Um, so let's see, it's, it's been a while, time flies by. Uh, so I've been uh, at City for a couple of years now and then before that was uh, investing for a different firm called Core Innovation Capital which was focused actually around social impact investing within financial services. So how can we really bring the capabilities that most people have when it comes to financial services to people who don't have it? Um, and how do we do that sustainably and at a cost that makes sense? So, uh, you know, that's sort of where my passion came from was for fintech in general was the fact that you know, there's a lot of good that can be done out of it. Uh, before that, um, you know, had worked on a couple of startups with uh, a few others uh, while I was in grad school. Um, we had hoped to bring uh, live broadcast television to, to everybody, and uh, now it seems like a, a thing that everybody has. So it's uh, you know it's a whole different world. Um, been invested before that as well. Was in private equity. Was in banking. So have been in financial services for almost my almost my whole career now. Awesome. Your turn, Matthew. And I'm Matthew Lamel. I'm a co-founder of Kretsu Capital and also of Fifth Era. Uh, Kretsu Capital is part of Kretsu, which is the most active uh, technology investor and the largest angel group in the world. Uh, last year, we backed about 175 companies across all sectors. So we're sort of agnostic to geography, technology, or indeed uh, the nature of the startup and its focus. Um, it's really anything that resonates with our members and then potentially make sense to put in our fund is fair game at Gretsu. So that's, uh, that's the first hat. And then the second hat is with my wife, Alison Davis, who's also a fintech expert. Um, we have our own family office and we back about uh, four or five companies a year in digital content, electronic commerce and fintech. And um, so that's sort of what I do today. Historically, I uh, came here 30 years ago and I uh, was a partner of large consulting firms and the West Coast practice leader in the 90s, Freyti Kani. Um, began to do a few angel investments as a hobby in the, right, the run-up to the dot-com boom. And uh, re it really got my attention that this is an innovation-based economy and there's so much change, disruption, opportunity sort of stemming from 
this handful of square miles that is the Bay Area and I decided to double down and spend more and more of my time in that ecosystem. Went full time as an angel investor for the first time in about 2000 and since 2006 that's really been my focus and I enjoy it enormously both for the stimulation of working at the leading edge of different industries and technologies but also because it's just the it, everything starts off so upbeat and optimistic when you interact with entrepreneurs and there's a great idea obviously most of them fail or at least half of them fail so things go in a slightly different direction over time but the stimulation of the environment is really why I still do it very good um, I know we before we kind of really got you know moved into some deeper questions we wanted to get a feel for who's in the audience so uh, show of hands um, uh, any first-time entrepreneurs in the audience no Okay. Ooh, oh, first. Yeah. First. part of a couple entrepreneurial Nice. Um, any other? What are some additional people you'd like to identify in the audience? So entrepreneurs, investors, corporate types. What, you know? Any investors? Raise your hand. Any? There you go. There are two of them. Corporate types. No. <laughs> You're just a jack of all trades. What, is, what does everyone else do? Yeah. Yes. Co-founder. Repeat entrepreneurs. Repeat entrepreneurs. All right, yeah, you raise go. your hand if you're a repeat entre entrepreneur. Got <laughs> it. A few okay. more. You? I just have a friend raise finance at the moment. Oh, great. All right, you're Series A. I remember I talked to you, healthcare company. <laughs> um, you work here at, at uh, OFX. You are a former hedge fund. Now you're yes. transitioning out. You, sir? Yeah. Uh, I just moved back to the U.S. I'm pounding pavement, trying to get a corporate role. Okay. You, sir? I'm taking English class. Very good. All right. <laughs> We've um, got diversity, if anything. Yes, Definitely. Exactly. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. So what was the, let's see here. Oh, yeah. We wanted to take a look at the investor landscape. Uh, what different types of investors are out there to sort of run through uh, start with, you just spoke, so we'll, we'll go with you, Vic, Victoria. What are, what are some investors out there and, and uh, how do they look at things differently? I mean, you guys are both, you could also talk about how you're both sort of in different spots yourself in terms of uh, how you invest and, and your roles. How, well, we could also talk about how that uh, makes you uh, look at things differently too. So. Yeah. I mean, I think as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of options and today you have more options than ever before, right? So. Um, you know, when it comes to investors, there are early stage investors and late stage investors. There are corporate strategic investors and financial investors. Uh, there are investors that are super active in your company and there are investors that are super passive in your company. So, you know, it really depends on where you are stage wise, where you are in terms of your industry. Uh, and also at the end of the day, you know, what, what you need as an entrepreneur, right? What you're looking for. So um, investors really, they, they vary quite a lot. So I, I can speak a little more to, to us in general. So we're a corporate strategic investor. We do early stage investing, but not super early stage investing, right? So what we're looking for is really a series, maybe a series A to a series C company. Um, you know, they're post-product development, they're in market, they're, they're looking for a partner to help really accelerate that commercial growth, right? Um, and that's quite different from, you know, what, what you guys do. So maybe it would help to <laughs> give a little background there. And I thought Victoria did a good job then. But uh, conventionally, we would have said there was friends and family, the people that first give you a check if you're an entrepreneur. It would have been followed up by some angels, then some more angels, and then if you were lucky and you got to that point, a VC through expansion capital, a corporate VC perhaps, all the way into the IPO market. Um, some of the new things that have really changed the landscape, uh, one is the rise of incubators and accelerators, which bring a lot of expertise and knowledge, but the angels tend to scout those out, so you may get some capital too. Um, the second is uh, the really the retrenchment of most venture capitalists from pre-Series A, so that now that's even more uh, uh, the space for the angels to, the, that the angels have occupied. And then we're seeing some other very novel uh, approaches, crowdfunding, which is sort of technology-enabled micro-lending into early-stage tech companies by the broad population, certainly the accredited population of the states. 
And then nowadays, for some areas like blockchain, we're also seeing uh, the rise of uh, blockchain-specific financing, such as ICOs, initial coin offerings. And then for the entrepreneurs in the room, obviously, depending upon your industry, there's all sorts of grants and scholarships, all the way up to multi-million dollar, you know, National Institute of Health financing or, uh, you know, aerospace and defense financing, depending upon what sector you're in. There's a lot of money that can be untapped in sort of non-dilutive financing from those sort of sources too. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. So. Uh, you guys are looking for what you described once as value exchanges. And um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that and just then you also put in your two cents too. What is, what, what is a value exchange that you're, how does that, how does that look? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that? so I remember that conversation. Um, so what I mean by that is that you as an entrepreneur, you're giving up a part of your company, right? And the hopes of giving up that portion of your company is that this capital and this investor is going to help you grow that company in some way so that it's worth more in the future for, for yourself, right, um, as well as all of your, your stakeholders. Uh, and so when I, when I talk about value exchange, it's, it's really thinking hard about what is it that you need uh, to take your company to the next level, right? Capital obviously being one piece of that, but are you in, at a stage in which you're really looking for someone who understands product? Are you looking for someone who can help you with introductions to Fortune 500 companies for business development? Are you looking for someone who can help you hire that next level of management, right? The, the CFO that helps take you public, maybe. Um, and so all of these things are, are value that an investor can bring uh, or, or doesn't bring, right? So when, as, if I was an entrepreneur, those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm thinking about, right? Um, and then if you're even earlier stage, there's different incubators and accelerators. Some of them offer things like you know, design teams that will help you actually create that new product while others introduce you to angel investors, right? Um, while maybe you, know, you might decide to do something completely different where you know, you're really looking for someone uh, to help you. This, is, this has actually been pretty recent. I was just talking to a, a firm that does this. Um, you know, they're giving legal advice right, in exchange for uh, helping you. Um, you know, they invest in the company. They give you legal advice. And that's how you actually grow the company, because now you're operating in a, in, in a different type of space. Right? So all of that is a consideration set for what value you're getting for that piece of your company. What are your thoughts, uh, Matthew? Uh, well, I think piggybacking on that, the, uh, I think broadly there are a number of reasons why different investors invest. Obviously, there's the financial gain. There is some sort of a strategic rationale. There may be a mission, and there may be a feeling of give back. And if you're speaking to a professional investor, almost certainly it's either financial return and or it's a strategic rationale. So. If you're a big healthcare company, you may want a financial return, but you're primarily investing because you want access to new technologies and products that you think are meaningful in the context of your business. Um, if, when you come to private wealth, which is friends and founders, uh, crowdfunding, angel investors, the other rationales often kick in. So, you know, all of these wealthy people in America are philanth philanthropists as well as. Uh, for profit in their motivation. And they'll go in and out. Uh, sometimes they'll be investing for financial return. Sometimes they'll be investing because they believe in the mission or the purpose. Sometimes they want to give back time and energy for something that they think is, or, or to a person that they think is worthy of support. It's really, really important that entrepreneurs diagnose before the meeting who they're meeting with and what is going to be the primary motivation of that person because if you go in with a financial pitch to a strategic investor, you may miss the whole point that they want something very specific from you and that's why they're taking the meeting. Similarly, if you go in with a philanthropic pitch to someone who's only financially motivated, there's a fair chance that you'll miss each other. So, um, you know, we often see, if you will, generic pitches and I highly, I always encourage people to start first with the investor they're talking to, their motivations and what they want out of the meeting and change the document if you need to rather than just always come up with the same story. Yeah, one of the things we talked about was uh, entrepreneurs 
how do you know what type of investment you want? Maybe if you're, if you have, you think you want an investor who's more passive, but maybe you come along and you see, oh, the, actually, there needs a whole lot more help than that. Um, maybe talk about a scenario like that where, where the. Uh, well, well I, I actually don't see why anyone would want a passive investor. Okay. Really. Yeah. I mean, the certainly through until you're a cash flow positive company, you always need help. Uh, and the most powerful help, certainly we say for startups, typically, the most powerful help is, the, is a, a customer, someone who will actually use your product, buy your product and say it works. And a, an angel with a network can open doors to your first set of customers. That's incredibly valuable. Later on, the value could be people who understand you know, and have relationships with GPs of corporate ventures or big venture capital firms can open a door, make a reference. Later on, it could be someone that can help you build your team. But the notion that capital is more important than the other types of assistance, I think that's upside down. Um, it's, you know, the, the companies that get ahead, it's not just because they have money, it's because the world's doors are opening up for them. And typically, it's other people who are opening those doors. So even the best entrepreneurs in the world, even given extensive relationships and network, can't get that much of the work done by themselves. They need help, the help of others. So I, I'm definitely at the extreme of value-added investors, including corporate, you know, corporate venture investors, is what a, a typical entrepreneur should focus on trying to get. Um, I, your piggyback, yeah. Yeah, so I think it all comes back to fit, right? You're looking for the right fit for what you're trying to build as an entrepreneur. So what I mean is that, let's say that you're a, uh, let's say you're building a consumer products company, right? Um, maybe the best, most interesting option is actually to do crowdfunding on Kickstarter, right? It's non-dilutive, you get validation, do customers want this? Um, you also get to build a fan base around it. Um, if you're a, let's say you are, you know, building a, a new type of nuclear reactor, right? you're probably not going to start a Kickstarter campaign. You might actually get some DOE funding, right? Um, let's say you want to be, a, you know, you want to build a, a new lending company within financial services, right? Uh, the, the capital requirements and the types of investors you're going to want for that, they're, they're all going to vary, right? They're all going to be different. So I think it all comes back to this idea of, you know, finding the right fit for, for the type of company you want to build. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we've, uh, anything else you want to say? No, good. Good. Yeah, we've made it a little complicated going into everything and the, the dynamics and the changing, the shifting, changing investor landscape. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. But what about uh, you individually? Um, what are you looking for specifically? Get, go ahead and uh, make it simple. And also your general advice a lot of the time. If, a couple general bits of advice and then maybe I'll ask you to go a little deeper. Uh, sure. You mean just in terms of the things we invest in? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, like I said, so we, we vertically, as an industry, we invest in enterprise IT and we invest in fintech and commerce. Uh, what we're looking for stage-wise, it's anywhere series A to series C. It's post-product development, it's in market, and really at the end of the day, it's about how can we, it's, you know, how can we help our entrepreneurs grow their companies, right? So what that means is you're at a stage where you're looking to go international. We're a global bank, right? So we're um, in countries all over the world. Uh, or maybe you're looking for distribution of a financial product. We've got 200 million customers, right? We understand our customers in a, in a way that might be helpful, right? Or maybe you're trying to take your general enterprise IT uh, technology into a financial services vertical, which is very different, right, in terms of what our requirements are um, around data. Um, so all of, you know, all of those th things are ways in which we can create value into those companies. And so we're always looking for, okay, we invest in a company today, but these are all the things that we can do because the platform that we have and the network that we have, and then what comes out that other end, we're hoping is gonna be even more value add, right? To the customers of that startup, to the startup itself, to the investors. So I, I'll give you two answers. You're for, a little earlier in this. In well, for Koretsu, we are uh, in the world of angel investors. We're actually a relatively late angel investor. So most of the companies that get traction with Koretsu will be after the seed round. They'll be the bridge, 
uh, and then the Series A. And, and nowadays we do a lot of Series A, sometimes in life sciences it will be later, and that goes back to the point I mentioned before, which is over the last few years, most venture capitalists exited uh, pre-Series A, and that left this space for us. Uh, so I would say most of our members want to see a company. Uh, I would say three quarters of the time it's a returning serial entrepreneur. They know what they're doing. They built a company before. It doesn't mean that first-time entrepreneurs can't do well, but for the most part, most first-time entrepreneurs will find it worthwhile to go to an incubator accelerator just to learn the basics. So most of our CEOs at Kretsu are returning serial entrepreneurs. They'll have probably a pretty good product already built. It may even be finished. They'll have a few uh, prototype situations, maybe some revenue. They're typically cash flow negative, so they still need cash to prove the business model. Uh, occasionally, they're cash flow positive and they're using our money to scale up. So I'd say that's sort of the sweet spot for Kretsu. For Alison and I at Fifth Era, um, and I should, my, Alison is my co-author, and my, my wife and partner. Uh, she's a fintech expert, so she sits on the board of directors, thank you, of uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, where she runs the Innovation and Technology Committee. She's on the board of Fiserv and Unisys. She used to be the uh, CFO of Barclays Global Investors, which is the world's largest asset management company. And uh, on the first, uh, you know, first data board and, and other things, Zoom and Uma and so on. So she's really deep in financial services. I have the same depth in electronic commerce, having been the head of strategy and corp dev for Gap in the past and having spent most of my time in, in this world. So, so I would say, first, we think we have relationships and network. That's our value added. So we're looking for entrepreneurs, typically, you know, pretty pretty sophisticated teams often spinning out of a Google or a, uh, an eBay or something like this have been working on something or have it in their heads, know how to build it. But what they want is the business partner that can open doors, help them raise money, help them fine tune strategy and go to market strategy. And so they don't need us to help them to, to build the model, uh, the build the product. They need us uh, to help them figure out how to really take it to the world. And like I say, we only look for four or six of those per year. And so they're very unique situations. We had talked about, uh, just so moving to some general trends of uh, the dynamics of investing today that we're seeing in the fast changing culture of Silicon Valley. Um, you, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned earlier, I think even just a few months ago was that uh, VCs are, are, are getting in later, writing bigger checks. Let's talk about some of the things like so let's talk about that first i mean right. i think a lot of entrepreneurs might expect that they would get a vc to be one of their first investors is it and so that's yes. you're saying that's not entirely likely it's it's <laughs> almost certain not to happen so just to put it into context and we wrote a book on this build your fortune in the fifth era available at amazon but uh we wrote a book to try and demystify the realities of how investing is occurring in america so the, these are the facts. Uh, the venture capitalists last year backed about 7,700 companies, of which less than 2,000 was their money going in for the first time. So the other 5,000 were follow-on investments to portfolio companies they'd already backed. So in practice, they only backed less than 2,000 companies last year. And that's the entire venture capital industry, 1,200 firms. So the average firm only did one and a half deals last year. To put that into context, the angels backed 70,000 companies and more. So it's, it's not just 10 to 1. If you compare the 70,000 with the 2,000 or less, the numbers are enormously different. If you double click on the VC 2,000 companies and said, well, what sort of companies were those? A large slug of them were companies being created by founders that that VC firm had already backed on a prior engagement and to a successful outcome. Um, and so I think it's fair to say the chances of a normal entrepreneur getting VC backing pre-Series A is the minimus. Um, but we see many entrepreneurs spending an awful lot of their time with VCs. And I feel like that is wasted effort. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. But the reality is the venture capital industry is constantly scouting the ecosystem. They want to see what's going on. Sometimes they have portfolio companies in the same space. 
They'll, they, their associates and analysts will take meetings, they'll come to TechCrunch or Web Summit or, or, or South by Southwest, and the entrepreneurs will think they're there to invest, but they're not. And the numbers prove that. Uh, the reality is they're there to learn, hear, take information back to the firm, and the chances of you breaking through and getting a VC round as your first round is the minimus. Um, so the, the other side of that, the good news, is there are more angels than ever, about 300,000 in America. You can find all of the angel groups at the ACA. There's one near you. And you can, find, you can go and meet them, speak to them, and they're there to back companies. And they will typically write checks early. Some of them all the way back to the formation round. Uh, certainly by the seed, most angels will, will take a serious look. Victoria, your thoughts on that trend? <laughs> uh, so I would say that actually, you know, there's somehow it's bifurcated uh, the very early stage between seed and angel at this point, right? Where um, I would say, yes, if you're looking for your very first check, you know, we're not the right firm for you, right? But what I, what I have found is because it's taking less capital to actually build companies today than it was a decade ago, right? Uh, you actually do see a lot of VCs go further downstream into like the earlier stage and they're making some seed bets to help to support that pipeline of companies that hopefully will come out into a Series A, right? Um, so you do see some of that uh, happening, and, and even for our fund, like we've done a couple of seed investments as well, where we have a particular perspective on this industry and this particular uh, market, and we want to make a bet in it, right? Um, and there, you know, you do see that happening. But for your for your first check, you know that fifty thousand dollars you need, you know your your uncle, your parents, your friends, families, and whoever else you can pull together. Um, I do think that most of that ends up being done by angels. Yeah. So just to give you even a sharper edge on this, the pitch book third pitch book is the organization that tracks all funding in America for the National Venture Capital Association, and all VCs report their data to pitch book because they need to both to get ranked and rated by people like Cambridge Associates, but also if, because their own LPs expect it, their limited partners expect it. Uh, so the third quarter headline is the US VCs invested $20 billion this quarter, one of the highest quarters ever, but they appear to be abandoning early stage and most of that money is going in later and later. And uh, Uber, as an example, raised as much money last year as the VCs gave to every deal they did pre-Series pre, uh, A. Uh, two billion went to one company, and every other company they backed, uh, some approaching 2,000, raised about the same amount of money. So I, uh, I don't actually agree with Victoria. I think for most entrepreneurs, it's you do whatever you want to do, but most of the 70,000 tech entrepreneurs that got backed last year got backed by angels, and less than 2,000 of them got a VC check. Okay. You want to, want to fight more? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm kidding. And that doesn't mean that she yeah, doesn't no. write checks. I mean, you might yeah. do 5, 10, 15 maybe last year, early stage checks? Uh, we do about, yeah, about 10 to 15 per yeah. year. So they're yeah. definitely out there, but the point is Just there's very few of them. them. Very few mm -hmm. of them. Got it. Any other particular trends that are We'll go back to you. Any other trends sort of ju jumping into your mind when you, when you think about the dynamic, the, the playing field of investing today? Mm -hmm. I'd say the only thing uh, that's slightly different in the later stage space for us is that there are more investors willing to write extremely large checks. So, you know, the idea of Uber, like that, you know, unicorns in general, right? Relatively new concept. Most of those companies would have gone public, right? Um, but now you can go out and you can raise a $500 million round. Uh, so there's a lot of capital, both in terms of like, you know, there's foreign capital, there's also, uh, you know, fund capital, hedge funds, crossover funds, mutual funds now becoming VC funds. Like, there's just a lot more available for entrepreneurs who want to stay private, 
right? That, uh, so that actually, that actually makes it more difficult as a VC because now you have companies that will be private 10 years, 12 years down the line. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to have that option that wasn't there before. Yeah, for sure. We also, very quickly, we talked about the rise of crowdfunding accelerators and incubators. We did already mention the rise of the ICO as a new phenomena. Um, private uh, companies are staying private longer and raising more capital and what used to be public market capital is coming in to private companies, which is obviously a shift. Um, I think a couple of other things, the rise of the corporate venture groups, there are more of them and they're more active than ever, uh, which means that most large companies at this point are scouting the innovation ecosystem and trying to buy in opportunities and technologies. Um, if you took the healthcare industry, for example, they used to be 90% of their dollars in their own labs and 10% buying stuff in. They flipped that almost. So the Pfizer's and the Merck's of the world have skinned back their internal teams and they rely upon external life sciences companies to do the early work. And that's now rippling through other industries too. So we're seeing more and more industries relying upon the external entrepreneurial ecosystem for their research and development. And then they're much more acquisitive in the mid stage. And that's the other point which, um, you know, we, the press is always full of the IPO, the public, op you know, these 10 companies have filed for IPO. But the reality is that 90 plus percent of exits are corporate acquisitions. Okay. And again, yeah. for entrepreneurs, that has an implication. You should be building companies that other people want to buy. And most entrepreneurs think that they are actually building companies that can one day be public. Socorro does that really well, mm. but overwhelmingly successful entrepreneurs build companies that other companies want to buy. Any yeah, I think that uh, definitely true. M&A um, is much bigger part of your exit opportunity than IPO. Uh, but I do think that entrepreneurs who end up building companies that can be standalone long run are are attractive companies to then be purchased by um, an acquirer, yeah. right? So companies that are doing well are always in a position of strength when it comes to uh, M&A. Yeah. If you look back over the last 10 years, only 15% of exits have been more than 50 million. That's the, in the exit value. 85% of exits were less than 50 million. So whilst I agree with Victoria's point that those even, might have, even then they might have been viable businesses, the exit value there is 50 million or less. Yeah. And that, that also implies a lot for how much dilution and how much capital should you take because uh, in most cases, you can dilute faster than you can accelerate towards a good exit, especially if the exit's still going to be capped at a 50 million or less exit. Um, and we see a lot of founders running into the trap of taking on board more capital, diluting themselves, but ending up with the same exit they could have got to with much less capital. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, talking about companies that are worthwhile, that, that interest you, which, uh, which companies excite you when you, when you see which company types uh, excite you when you see them? Company types. Yeah. Um, so I think there's there's company types and then there's entrepreneur types. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes they we don't. We can two-part it. We uh, can so double, you know, pink, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, areas of interest right now that I'm excited about, uh, I would definitely say applications for um, for machine learning and AI in financial services, right? How does that really manifest itself in a way that gives you greater personalization, greater um, product recommendations, um, you know, better servicing, better experiences? I think that's really exciting. I think that uh, insurance is an area that's going through a similar phase that you know banking and lending went through a couple of years back, right? Where okay, now we're you know you're doing digitization, you've got aggregation, you've got you know all this data. How can you use it to create new products? How can you use it to create better experiences, right? I think that's really exciting. Um, we're always, always looking at companies that can help us better manage our regulatory and compliance requirements, right? So how does technology transform the way that that works today for a financial services firm? I think all of that is, is super, super exciting, right, um, for us. Awesome. Of course, you have the slightly later stage FinTech view. Awesome. 
Yeah. Now your turn. <laughs> and for me, it's, so it's, it's actually very barbell. It's yeah. like a barbell. So on the one hand, uh, entrepreneurs that basically agree with everything I just said. <laughs> no, but it's an intact team. They know what they're doing. They're deep experts in the space. They're passionate about it. They're forming a company. They know how to build the product. They understand you're going to bootstrap. You don't want to overraise in terms of the capital you bring on board. And you're pragmatic that you're building a business that's going to get to a modest exit. But if you are a founder and you get to a 50 million exit and you still own 30 or 40% of the equity, it's a very good thing. And uh, they're building companies that others will buy because that's where the massive exits are. That is, when someone articulates that, especially if they're already cash flow positive and they're looking for some money to scale up, that's a very easy thing to back. And it's going to be, if I get in at a 5 million pre or a 7 million pre and we exit at a 50, 60 million, it's a 10x for me. So that's a very good thing. At the other end of the barbell, I'm also an adjunct professor at Singularity University. And I do oh, understand cool. that it's important we change the world. And innovation and technology can do that. And so once in a while, you'll hear someone with just an enormous idea. And they, you know, it's, it's like really, it's just a, a world-changing thought. And that's very exciting too. But, you know, that's a different ball game. That is literally, you know, several hundred million dollars and massive of, expert, uh, of expertise and, and so on. And, and I definitely would say, you know, let's go out and talk to Roloff Poter or Mike Moritz or someone like this and see if they'll get behind this idea too, Vinod Kozer or whatever, because you're going to need 100, 200, 300 million dollars to make that a reality. And for me as an investment, you know, that might still be attractive if I can get a little bit of options or equity at the beginning. But the reality is that's something that a handful of VCs do really well. There's only about 200 uh, unicorns in America, you know, private companies worth a billion dollars or more. And if you look at who backed them, you'll see it's a handful of names. Hmm. So it's Sequoia, it's Kleiner Perkins, it's Andreessen. There's a handful of names. And the other 1,000 VCs don't have a unicorn. Hmm. So if you're going to go down that path of... of uh, change the world, build new markets, huge, big idea. There's only a handful of VCs that know how to do that. And the other 1,000 are, are not the ones that you should speak with. Yet. Well, Maybe. everyone aspires. <laughs> everyone aspires. But everyone aspires. It, it takes a lot. And it's not just a lot of capital. Yeah. You know, uh, I think Sequoia says, we are very good at building public companies. And I think they are. They have the most, 24 at last count. Um, but most VCs don't really understand how that game is played. Right. OK, uh, we'll go to the entrepreneurs. Um, Vicky, or Vic, Victoria, sorry. Um, personality of the entrepreneur, what works, what doesn't? For you, um, OK. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that, you know, that I look for. Right. I think the most important for me is that the entrepreneur has passion for the idea that they're that they're working on and, and not just passion in, internally for themselves, but passion to actually be able to to talk about and explain that to, to others. Right. To really inspire other people because they need to recruit people to come work with them, to become employees. They need to inspire their customers to purchase their product they need to be able to get funding from investors right and so you know i i'm always looking for entrepreneurs where i feel like yes like i would leave my job to work with this person right and i i can say that about the companies that i've invested in like i would i would go and work with them right um and i think that's really important because also i want to make sure that you know i'm investing in in, in firms where you're going to have this very long-term relationship right and as companies stay private longer maybe a 10-year relationship right uh longer than some marriages um so that's really important i think the other you know some of the other things that are are top of mind for me are around okay you know, when I think about entrepreneurs, are they not only really dedicated to this vision that they have, but also willing to take external advice, input perspectives, right? They don't have to 
take those ideas and, and go and do them, but they have to be able to absorb that, right, and learn from that and think about it and consider why they would or would not go down those paths. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's really important, right? And that's how startups end up pivoting, right? They, they start down one path, uh, maybe they're an e-commerce company, and next thing you know, they've pivoted completely into being a social media company, right? And, and it's because they found something there. Um, and the last thing I would say, it's really around, it's around insight. There is, I'm looking for someone who has this insight about their market that for whatever reason, existing players can't see or aren't interested in, right? Um, and that small, it can be very small, but make a huge difference. Uh, so, uh, for, you know, one of our portfolio companies, Plot, they had this insight where, hey, you know, Today, when you link your bank account, you got to go and find your account routing number and your bank account number. You got to wait for these micro deposits. You got to do all this stuff. And uh, we're going to change all that so that you can just log in to your bank account with your credentials, right? If you need to pay a credit card, a utility bill, if you want to build a PFM. And it's this very small, almost, it feels like it's, it's not a huge difference or a huge change. Uh, but actually, the numbers show that they get two to three times more conversion, right? It's, it's dramatic. Uh, and so it's those small insights that you're looking for in these companies where they found something that people currently in that market haven't seen yet, right? Awesome. For me, at least, um, and I agree with the, all of those things, I think that uh, I would say that what we know that there are very few technology entrepreneurs in the world, and there's very few in America. Uh, we know that because we look at the numbers and there's very few people getting backed and there's even less uh, actually getting to any measure of success in terms of taking a company and getting it somewhere. Um, so I, and conversely, there's enormous amounts of technical or business or other types of domain knowledge and expertise being taught and, and being learned. So my feeling is that the critical, if you will, the short, the short fall, the piece of the puzzle that you need to find, the Achilles heel of success, is behavioral. Um, and, you know, I've been asked by many countries around the world, including China and the UK and others, to help them set up innovation hubs. And the more I go down this path, the more I really think that you can't teach people to be successful entrepreneurs. I think that the key behavioral characteristics are learned in the first 10 or 12 years of life. And they're not all together good characteristics. So, you know, it's a stubbornness, uh, can-do attitude, will walk through walls to make whatever they believe happen. And yet at the same time, to Victoria's point, collaborative and team-oriented in this day and age. And that's a very unique blend, you know. I will not allow someone to get in the way of my idea. It is going to be successful. I, we will make this a success. But at the same time, I'm collaborative and team-oriented rather than intransigent and bloody-minded. So that's a very unique person. And one of the reasons why we, Kretsu, we tend to back serial entrepreneurs is because if someone's taken a business from nothing to something and successfully exited, then they must have had a critical mass of the, good, the right stuff. And so you know if you back them again, there's a pretty good chance that they won't make the obvious mistakes. But um, Guy Kawasaki on his website has a little self-analysis tool. And for the entrepreneurs in the room, I encourage you to take it because you answer a few questions and he comes back and rates you. But I can promise you he's rating you based upon your, your soft behavioral answers to the questions. It's not, do you have a computer science degree? And if so, what did you score? It's more, how would you interact with other people and do you believe your ideas are good ones? It's, those are the questions that he uses uh, to sort of define you know, the, pre, the, the prerequisites for a, a successful entrepreneur. And then the only other point is, um, everyone will say the right person at the beginning stage may not be the right person at the mid stage, may not be the right person at the late stage. And I think really good entrepreneurs know when to hand over their business to someone else and a lot of grief gets uh, avoided if that can be done in a relatively seamless way. Okay, anything to add? Victoria, before we go to questions? No, I think, good. yeah. Any questions?
right, go for it. Uh, thank you both very much for your insights and thoughts. Um, Matthew, I'm interested in your, uh, you've got a good head for figures and, and a good analysis of what's going on in the market. Can you give us an idea of fintechs uh, at the seed stage, roughly sort of what valuations um, people oh. are putting on the businesses? And right. follow up question, if I may. <laughs> right. Um, what sort of due diligence do you do uh, for yes. companies, um, say, either at the seed stage? C stage or the pre-A stage. Okay, so Victoria actually, yeah, also, uh, Victoria should weigh in on this too because she's a, a thematic focused fintech investor, if I understand correctly. But um, for us, um, things are, are becoming very strange very fast, and part of it is the ICOs. Um, if there's a space in the world where we are seeing blockchain beginning to get more traction than most, it's in broadly defined fintech. It's in payment payment and processing businesses and sort of trust-based, you know, authentication businesses, which by definition, all fintech and real estate tech and insurance tech have those characteristics. And there, the valuations have just gone uh, 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 absolutely insane. And so, for example, I saw one business uh, a couple of days ago, I won't name it, but they're putting together a platform to enable a certain type of transaction to occur and they're putting a $150 million cap on their convertible note. They haven't even got a live product and they have no revenue. So things are really getting weird very fast. Historically, um, FinTech might be 10% of what our angel group backs. And um, for a pre-revenue company with an unfinished business, you might have asked for a $5 million cap on a convertible or a price round. Maybe the team, if they were truly a phenomenal team, might get a $10 million cap. But the problem with the 10 million cap, well, we can't, we don't want to set ourselves up for an ugly situation with a VC if they come on board. And the traditional VC round might have been 5 million on a 10 million pre or something like this, 10 to 12 million pre. So as soon as the, you know, as soon as we're doing a price round that makes that equation difficult to operate, we're going to see a down round. Uh, the, the convertible is obviously a different story. So that's, that's, so without knowing your specific circumstance, if you have a transaction processing businesses and you can use blockchain and do an ICO, go over there. <laughs> it's crazy money and you don't even give up any equity for it. You just sell a token, whatever that means. But Victoria, what are you seeing? Uh, well, the, the regulator is certainly paying attention now. Yes. So I'd, I'd also look into that before you actually do that. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's funny, like, at the end of the day, it's you're worth whatever someone's willing to pay. So all this stuff that we're talking about averages is sort of just on average, right? Um, and it ties back into when I think about companies, there's a couple of different hurdles of risk, right? There's team risk. Do you even have the team to build a product? There's product risk. Have you built the product? There's sort of product market fit risk. Is anyone buying your product, right? Um, and so depending on where you are in that spectrum, your valuation may be different, right? So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, how much do you actually need to get into your next round? Because how much you need will also influence, you know, kind of what's, what stage you actually need to be at, right? So as a lot of, you know, a lot of investors, they want to own a certain percentage of, of your company, right? So if you, if you only need 500K, that's very different from if you need $2 million, right, to get started. So there's a little bit of math there as well um, when it comes to the, the valuation. I think that's very good. In fact, we would always prefer a team and an entrepreneur that did a multi-round funding strategy and came in and said, here's what we plan to do now, next year, the year later, and hopefully the valuation's going up. And if you do the maths right, you end up in a better place from a dilution point of view as the founders and entrepreneurs than if you took more money up front. Even if it was a higher valuation, you might end up in a worse place. So we, uh, and for us that also, if, if, you know, if someone comes in with that sort of a story, I'm raising a million now, two million next year, and then we'll try and do five million later. I'm not, it doesn't have to be those numbers. No. As angels, we can look at that and say, well, we could easily get together and do the million. But if you came in and said it's a $5 million round, we're going to say you need to speak to a VC. Yeah. Right? Even though our biggest round last year was $10 million, we have the belief that $5 million is too much to get from angels. 
And so that's another reason why breaking it up into several pieces of, of money over time yeah. is more likely to get a positive response from people who can't write $5 million checks. Thank you. And could you yeah. just briefly cover off sort of your approach to the due diligence process? Oh, due diligence. So, so uh, we're at the extreme of crowd, the wisdom of the crowd. So, and I know Victoria will probably be at the other extreme of high quality professional due diligence. In our case, the people that like your company put up their hands, they get together, and a subset of them then do the due diligence. And if there's 10 of them, hopefully there's an accountant, a lawyer, someone who knows your industry, someone who knows go to market, a people oriented person to check on your team. And together, they do the due diligence. Um, the best entrepreneurs have already done a first draft of the due diligence. So they come in and they basically say, here's my Dropbox or box, here's all my files and folders, here's everything you need to know. And you know, we, the angels will then come to their own decisions, but at least you're giving them you know, a, a, a running start. Yep. And that also, I, and I highly recommend that because what you want to avoid is unexpected problems that surface during due diligence. So, for example, you gave out options and you didn't document it. It's like, you know, we, you know, how can anyone invest if there's a potential ticking time bomb of some employee out there who thinks they've got something and you're telling, saying they do or they don't? So um, cleaning yourself up before you go into due diligence is very important uh, as part of the process. But in fact, we've published online, it's actually an ebook, which is the Kretsu Forum Due Diligence Process. And any of you can take it and look at it, and it will give you a good sense of what our expectations are. But professional due diligence is sort of the other answer to the question, I'm sure. Yeah, so, so we do pretty significant diligence. Um, and it comes in a couple of different forms, right? So one is obviously we do dilig due diligence on the team. So can you execute and do what you, you say you want to do? Have you historically been someone who does what he says he's going to do? Um, we do diligence on the, the market, right? So research around, okay, is the, is the market there for this product? Because there's a lot of things you can change in, around a product, but it's very difficult to change the demand in a market, right? Um, and that includes a lot of customer calls, right? Or even potential customers that are within our own network, uh, including City itself, right? So if you think about, especially something around, say, security, you know, surprise, hackers really want to hack into City and other financial institutions, we have some really, really great info security people. Um, so we'll talk to them around diligence, right? Uh, when, you know, w there's technical diligence as well. So what does your stack look like? Um, what are some of the capabilities that you have around data governance? That kind of stuff. Um, and then we do business diligence, right? So, you know, can you actually, can you actually get to your target for next year, right? So if you want to get 100,000 customers, what's the plan for that? How are you, you know, how are you going to do it? What's your marketing uh, strategy around it? And is it possible? So there's, um, there's pretty extensive diligence on our side. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. All right. Because yes. Um, thank you so much uh, for both of your time. Um, I have a question. Um, you obviously both uh, speak to uh, a tremendous number of investors. Um, what percentage of entrepreneurs that you speak to are women? It's kind of a yeah. topic uh, in the area, and I'm just curious, at that level, at the entrepreneurial level, how, how does that uh, demographic look? Yes. Well, at the angel level, I can tell you that in the U.S., about 15%, 1.5% of angels are female. At Kretsu, it's more like 20%. And then amongst our chapter presidents, I think it's more like 40%. Um, it's still not more than 50%. And as you probably know, more than 50% of American wealth is in female hands, both because women outlive men and also because um, where, well, maybe. <laughs> but <laughs> the, um, so, you know, in an ideal world, I would have expected more than 50% of the angels of America would be female but it's not the case. Entrepreneurially, um, I think that we want to see more female entrepreneurs. We back a good number, but it's in the less than 20% range. It's probably 15, 10, 15%. In some sectors, I see it as being higher. So in consumer and retail, we probably have more female entrepreneurs. 
and in fintech we probably have less but across the board we'd like there to be more um, this Thursday if anyone's available we're going we're all going down to Renaissance which is the uh, the NGO here in the Bay Area that uh, helps support first-time entrepreneurs including female entrepreneurs and uh, it's a great gala great event we backed them for a long time there's Astia which is also here in the Bay Area, which helps prepare female entrepreneurs. Golden Seeds is an angel group that focuses on backing female entrepreneurs. But across the board, the answer is it's less than it should be. Yeah, I mean, there's not an, I think there's not enough. Um, I might be biased on that point, but you know, um, you know if you, and if you know of any <coughs> entrepreneurs in the, in the space, definitely send them my way. But even when I look in this room, uh, I see you know, two women. So it's, it's, there should be more, I think, is the answer to that. When I was in engineering school, this was about the same ratio. So it makes sense that that seems to propagate itself out into the, into the, into the Are you seeing a change in further diversification at all? Well, we, we are a, we're sort of a unique entity. Now, correct, Sue, we're a unique entity because we'll, our philosophy is that if a member thinks they can make money in a business or a deal, they're encouraged to bring it, regardless of what industry or sector. So we'll see, we'll see fashion businesses and consumer businesses. We'll see real estate plays, and um, in the small businesses of America, the 27 million or whatever it is, um, they are very highly. The, the, the female entrepreneur ratio is very high. I don't know, and I can't. I don't have the answer to why there aren't more female tech entrepreneurs. Uh, I actually don't. I don't know. I don't know why there aren't more. And uh, we're open to having everyone who wants come and visit as an entrepreneur. And by the way, all of you are welcome just to ping me and be a guest at a Kretsu Angel event where you'll actually see what happens and the interaction. Then you can sort of self-select whether it's a good fit for you. Um, but anyhow, I, I agree with Victoria. If you have really good uh, entrepreneurs that you would like to direct away, regardless of sex or gender you know gender or orientation just send them our way <laughs> so i'm just going to jump in there um if anyone wants to go to my linkedin profile i did a project for a year when i first came here i looked like a starving artist video interviewed vcs including your wife um allison and had to find out why women are funded less than men and um it was a massive project uh, with great heart and passion i put into it and the summary of what everyone said, not my ideas, but what everyone said, is in that ebook. It's all text, you can read it on a mobile device. Um, and I've continued to give that out for free. Um, so it's definitely a passion of mine. And um, I really appreciate you guys coming tonight. I can't tell you how much I've learned <laughs> um, from both of you. It's been really, really amazing. And um, thank you so much, John. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah.